concept of the mandibles, the full, full title is uh, The Mandibles of Family 2029 to 2047. Um, it, it's, it's a two layer. Uh, one of those layers is uh, what is sometimes called future history. Uh, and that story is fundamentally economic. Uh, in the time between now and 2029, the value of the dollar has uh, gradually crumbled. The implication is that quantitative easing eventually had uh, consequences. And, uh, and the rest of the world has lost faith in the dollar. And that means that it takes a sudden plunge on the international currency markets and uh, Putin, who is still in control of Russia, this book is all about what I'm afraid of, um, and, and um, some other people, including um, people in China, uh, have a, a, an international currency all lined up to replace the dollar as the uh, dominant reserve currency, which they call the Bangkok. And in retaliation, the American president uh, renounces the national debt. He says, okay, all right, we're not going to pay the money back. And by this point, uh, that's, we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars. Uh, unfortunately, when people don't pay their debts, then you don't want to loan them any more money. So the U.S. is unable to borrow. It's still spending um, more money than it takes in in tax revenue. So in order to cover the shortfall, it starts printing money. Um, and that has the inevitable consequences of, of uh, triggering inflation, which starts slowly, but then of course drag, gathers steam as inflation always does. Um, and that is the background. In the foreground, we experience all these events through uh, four generations of one family. Uh, the surname is the Mandibles, and that is not a, a, a surname that I have ever encountered. If you know anybody whose name is Mandible, don't tell me, because I believe this surname belongs to me. Um, and uh, reviews have often described the family as, as very wealthy, but that's not exactly true. Their, their 97-year-old patriarch is quite wealthy. He has himself inherited uh, an industrial fortune from the olden days in the U.S. when we actually made things. And, um, but he, he refuses to die. So that money is stuck, right? And you're dealing with three other generations who more or less have expected to inherit something. But uh, the, uh, the son of the patriarch, when the book begins, is nearly 70 years old. So at a certain point, it's like, well, what's he going to spend it on? An, an especially posh assisted living facility? Uh, and I, one of the reasons I did this was that I think this is becoming commonplace, that uh, people are living so long that, uh, uh, that the, the money that, that uh, we sit around waiting to inherit in this same way gets stuck and may also just get spent. So. I think there's something um, demographically and economically accurate about that picture. The other reason that I chose to have a family that has money somewhere is that you have to have something to lose it. If I simply described a family that was broke and then the economy went to hell and they were still broke, we wouldn't have a story. Um, I, I thought it was important to keep that worm's eye view on the big historical events because I think that's one of the things that fiction is good for. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a vehicle for expressing the experience of ordinary people, of the individual, of bigger events. And I'm up firmly of the view that one of the only things that makes politics and big economics uh, important is because the way it expresses itself in our ordinary lives. So it's not a, it's not a petty way of expressing things, it's, it's actually the most meaningful way you, you can express big events, uh, uh, and, and I think it's one of the services that fiction uh, provides. It, is, it shows us, uh, on that nitty-gritty level, what, so, what sometimes big events mean for people. Um, 
I was originally inspired to write this book uh, because of, it was an idle moment. I, I don't know what took me so long to figure this out, <coughs> but I was a little curious uh, if, say, I lived as long as my uh, paternal grandfather, who lived until he was 96, how late in the century I was likely to be alive. And, uh, and it turns out, I mean, this is pretty simple arithmetic, it turns out that if I live to 96, I will still be alive in 2053. Now, what was interesting about that is not that I'm not so senile that I can still add, um, but I was horrified. You would think, oh great, you know, I get to live that long, I'll get to see what happens. Well, I'm afraid of what happens by mid-century. And so, I was interested in taking apart why I was so anxious. And why I was especially anxious about being really old in the middle of this century. Um, I think of the, the leading reason has to do with uh, human population growth, which is one of my uh, longest lasting interests. Our, uh, our population worldwide is likely to peak around 2050, and the UN has revised its median projection upwards now to at least 10.2 billion people. That's nearly 50% more than we've got now, and it's already 2016. I mean, it means that we're going to continue to expand as a species at an astonishing rate, and that's going to put stress on any number of resources um, so that my secondary concern is the availability of fresh water, which I think is the major constraint on the size of our species. Uh, as a consequence, the first line of this book is, don't use clean water to wash your hands. It's about living in a world of, of water shortage, so that you keep a bucket in the sink to catch runoff, and that's what you wash your hands in. Um, and I'm also anxious about food shortage, which is likely to express itself in terms of rising prices. A lot of people miss, they, they think there's plenty of food that the poor can't afford it, but actually that's because there's not enough food. So that's why the price rises. And that's one of the things that happens in the mandibles um, off to the side. I threw in everything that makes me nervous about um, the future. But I was especially anxious about economics, and, um, and this is a, an expressly um, economic dystopian book. There have been lots of dystopian books. Uh, this is not a fresh form. I was conscious of working in a tradition, and as a consequence I have regard for how much has already been achieved with the uh, books set in the future. Uh, some, of, some books set in the future are now technically set in the past. I mean, 1984 has passed us, though interestingly it remains a classic. Um, and you recall that that's a book that is primarily concerned with uh, political tyranny and a suppression of free speech. So I didn't want to write that book again. But I, I couldn't think of, of, of uh, other dystopian books that had really focused on, on dystopian economics. And so I threw myself into um, researching uh, a whole field that I hadn't interested me in the slightest beforehand. I, I used to use the business pages of the newspaper to clean my windows. <laughs> um, what I came to conclude is that uh, what we like to think of as a cataclysm in 2008, 2000, and, and, and that that was that was not so much about what had happened as what didn't. And I, I, I really feel we dodged a bullet. We looked into the, the abyss. We came very close to a situation where the entire international econ economic system fell apart. But it didn't. We patched it back together, barely. But a lot of the instabilities that brought us so close to the brink are still present. Um, in fact, to a, in some respects, they're worse than ever. All those um, complicated investment instruments 
they're still being sold. Um, and in particular, the uh, degree of debt that we now we are now in, uh, and that's public and private, uh, is is more extreme than ever. Um, the uh, in fact, what, one of our biggest problems right now is is sovereign debt. And between, um, if you if you actually exclude uh, banks and financial institutions, um, we're still 152 trillion dollars in debt worldwide, and that is 225 percent of GDP. The question becomes: When there's that much worldwide debt, is it ever going to be paid back? See, I don't think so. Um, and that's why I specifically turned to debt in this novel. If debt is not going to be repaid, then the money doesn't exist. It means that our entire world economy is built on fake money. And my worry is that there, at, at some point there's going to be an accounting, a reset. And that's going to wipe out vast quantities of wealth, and in an unfair way. The trouble is, it doesn't mean that it's just the hedge fund people and the, the bankers, and, and they're wiped out. It's anybody who has, has anything. Now, I'm very interested in debt as a moral issue, and I'm afraid that this is where my Presbyterian background comes into play. I am technically a, a, a non-believer. Uh, much to my parents' dismay. But uh, I think some of that uh, Protestant work ethic got into my head. Um, I think debt is a moral issue. And I totally agree that the, uh, the people who were caught up in the subprime mortgage crisis, uh, who were lured into uh, taking out mortgages that they couldn't afford with uh, fine print in them that nobody called their attention to, which meant that their payments would balloon at a certain point, and, and uh, they would lose their house. I'm totally sympathetic with those people. And yes, they were debtors, but they, they, they were tricked by some really wicked people. But I'm also sympathetic with creditors, and that's where I get all Protestant on your ass. <laughs> um, and that doesn't mean just a bunch of bankers. After all, if you have a bank account, you're a, cr you're a creditor. You have loaned the bank your money. The bank has custody of your money, and you have allowed the bank to have your money and invest it elsewhere. Um, if the bank doesn't give the money back, that's default. And to me, that seems like a grave injustice. Uh, when a loan is a contract, and one of the things that uh, civilization depends on is contracts and the, f and the fulfillment of contracts. So it's, it's basically keeping your promises. And um, therefore, I get aggrieved when people don't pay back their loans. I mean, even the people who, uh, even the, uh, uh, creditors uh, with Greece. I'm very sympathetic with what's happening with Greece, but still, they borrowed a lot of money and they're not paying it back. Um, and I'm, I am concerned uh, that in this weird zero interest rate environment, uh, we have institutionalized rewarding debtors, uh, people who um, are profligate, and punishing savers, people who are frugal. Uh, the interest rate that you don't get on your savings goes directly to people who are borrowing money for basically nothing. So I'm worried that we have created a massive moral hazard. Uh, and I thought I'd, I would read you a tiny little section that helps to express those feelings. Um, this is right after the president has gone on um, television and announced to the American people that uh, he, he is going to uh, renounce the national debt. And uh, one of my main characters, Florence, is riding home from work. She works at a homeless shelter. Riding the bus home, 
Florence couldn't resist a scroll through the news websites. Sure enough, they bannered wall-to-wall -wall outrage. By international consensus, the U.S. was now a pariah nation. All over the globe, there were riots outside American embassies, several of which had been overrun and looted. Her country's diplomatic service had ceased operations until further notice. American ambassadors and staff were evacuating their posts under armed guard. Now, Florence didn't think about being American very often, though that may have been typically American in itself. She didn't regard being American as especially formative of her character, and that may have been typically American, too. The 4th of July was mostly an excuse for an afternoon picnic in Prospect Park, and she was relieved that next year her son Willing would be old enough that he wouldn't be too disappointed if they didn't go all the way to the suffocating crowns along the East River to watch the fireworks. For years now, it had ceased to be controversial to suppose that the era of the American Empire was fading. And the notion that her country may already have had its day in the sun, she didn't find upsetting. Plenty of other countries had flourished and subsided, and were reputed to be pleasant places to live. She didn't see why being a citizen of a nation in decline should diminish her own life or make her feel personally discouraged. She was duly condemnatory of various black marks on the U.S. historical game card, the slaughter of the Indians, slavery, but not in a way that cut close to the bone. She hadn't herself massacred any braves or whipped Africans on plantations. This was different. She felt ashamed. And I'm afraid that's what I felt also between those two moving walkways at the airport. <laughs> I'm very interested in people's relationship to money, and I have written about it before. I think it, as a quantity, it fascinates me, because when you think about it, money itself, if it is not realized, if it is not spent, invested in something else, money is worthless. Money as a quantity has no value. So. It's only when it's transformed into something else that it has value or even meaning. So it's kind of elusive. And as a consequence, we tend to project onto it whatever it is we actually want. The odd thing about this projection is that we usually want things it can't buy, right? What do we want more than anything? We want respect. We want love. Uh, we want safety, but that's not necessarily on offer either. As an American right now, I don't feel especially safe. Uh, and it, as a matter of fact, that, that election demonstrates you can't even buy electoral success. Clinton outspent Trump by a huge amount of money. All that money did not buy the presidency. Um, I, 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 and much less can money buy happiness, whatever that is. Uh, it can't buy, uh, it, it can't buy knowledge, it, or it certainly can't buy wisdom. It might be able to buy education, but that doesn't make you wise. Uh, and it, it's also a quantity that can really distort relationships between people, and I'm especially concerned with the way that it can distort the relationship between generations, between parents and children, if, especially with parents who have some savings. Now, in this novel, um, the patriarch uh, has all this money. He's in a, a very uh, expensive uh, uh, assisted living facility, and 
his son comes and visits him uh, devotedly every month. But his son, whose name is Carter, is never quite sure why he visits. Is it because he loves his father and cares about his father, enjoys his father's company, and, and um, wants to comfort his father in his old age? Or does he just want the money? And you know, that becomes very difficult to parse. Uh, and as it turns out, when everything goes to hell economically in the U.S., that fortune we're talking about, and this happens early in the book, so I'm not exactly giving too much of the plot away, that fortune goes away virtually overnight, turns to ash. And that might sound a little sad, but you know, there are some upsides. And um, one of them is that the relationship between Carter and his father finally cleans up. And Carter realizes that he does actually care for his father, and it's not just a, a pecuniary interest on his part. But he, there, he had no way of knowing until the money goes away. But the other good thing about the way it cleans up the relationship is that suddenly the son is able to be a normal person and not tippy-toe around his father and be nice and, and keep, keep complaints to himself. He is able to be gruff and terse and cross and like a regular person instead of a, a, a little, uh, you know, arse like toady. And, um, and it's a relief for everybody. So I'm very interested in the way that money distorts relationships between other people. Um, and apropos of this business of money, what it will buy and what it won't, and um, it, I, thought, I thought I would read one other tiny section. This one's toward the end. And uh, it involves uh, my protagonist, Willing, who is at this point about 30 years old, and his great aunt, Nolly, um, or her full name is Enola Mandible, Nolly is a, a novelist who has lived several decades in um, Europe before coming home. And she says something of a one-hit wonder. And she bears strange resemblance to someone you've met. <laughs> Nolly dried her hands on the dish towel with an anxious twist. Young people want money to buy things, she said. Not only clothes and jewelry, but experience, thrills. Old people want money for one reason and one reason only, to feel safe. You can never have enough money to be safe, Willing said gently. Money itself isn't safe. We should know. And how, she seconded. But then, life isn't safe at 90 years old. Exactly, he said. The illusion of wealth is that it can buy what you want, which it can, but only if you want, like, a pretty dress. You don't want a dress. You want not to be old. We haven't talked about it much, but don't you wish one of those hothead boyfriends of yours had stuck around? Maybe you want to still be a famous writer, and you can't buy that either. There are no more famous writers. Or you want to write with the same fire that lit you up when you started that big bestseller. The kind of fire that hardly anyone gets to keep. You want the thicker hair and your old snapshots. You pretend you don't, but you want people to like you. You want not to get cancer. What threatens everything that's important to you isn't a cashless bank or currency depreciation or debt renunciation or economic collapse, but your own collapse. Other than able to, being able to pick up, you know, a nice bottle of wine or maybe a chicken. You can't buy anything you want. You kids think all we boomers live in a delusional bubble, she returned. Think it's come as a shock I've got old? I'm not an idiot. I've been reading since I was your age about elderly women raped and robbed in their homes. And in the back of my head, I've heard a whisper, pretty soon, honey, that's going to be you. I've always anticipated becoming a target, 
defenseless, weak, and on my own. Maybe my parents had a premonition. Ever work it out? Enola is alone, spelled backwards. So there was a discreet period in my 40s when I had the opportunity to salt away some reserves and in preparation for a rainy day that might last for decades, a monsoon, my own personal climate change. In my mind's eye, I was stockpiling a veritably physical fortification. If I bricked the bills high enough, the barbarians couldn't climb over. Less metaphorically, maybe I could pay them to go away. But that is delusional, Willing said. At your age, the main menace isn't rapists and robbers or waves of marauders in the second dark ages or anything else from the outside. Every day, you face down the enemy within. So the one commodity that you really can't buy more than any other is safety. Why doesn't that release you from trying to protect what you're going to lose anyway? It should make you feel brave. Now, um, one of the uh, tricks of this uh, book was uh, trying to control the scale. I really wanted to write a realistic novel, and that meant um, I didn't want hordes of rapists pouring down the street apropos of that passage. Um, I didn't want a bunch of zombies taking over Midtown Manhattan. Uh, I wanted you to feel that, that temporally this story was right next door, that you could really envision it being in your life. And that meant that the changes at the beginning had to be very gradual. So, you know, the, the decay of civil life happens by degrees. So at the very beginning, the maitre d' doesn't see you to your table at a restaurant, but just gestures to sit over there. Or the, uh, the doormen in um, nice buildings in Midtown don't carry your groceries anymore, even if you're old. Just these little, little things where people just aren't, they don't obey the rules anymore. Um, and even economically. Uh, early on, you know, it's really hard to get imported olive oil, um, which to me sounds like a catastrophe. Uh, and it's, uh, but in short order, it's not that you can't afford the olive oil even if you can find it, but you can't afford the mortgage on your house. So you can see that things have to start snowballing, but at gradual enough pace, that they can pick up speed. I mean, this, that's one of the arts of writing um, books that are about things falling apart, is you have to keep them from falling apart too, too fast, because then there's nowhere for the plot to go. And it's only at the very end that it gathers into, oh my god, this is out of control. And so that was, it, 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 that was an interesting experience. It just, it's, it, was like, it was like riding a horse and keeping the, the reins tight. Um, the other thing um, that I uh, experimented with this in this book is lingo, because you know we're always coming up with new slang, and it's it's a mystery where it comes from. But then suddenly we're all saying, um, uh, I don't know what are we saying lately? I'm completely <laughs> out of it. Um, but I, I invented a, a small set of new expressions for 2029. Um, uh, instead of saying someone is a jerk, or as you say in the UK, a wanker, um, you're a boomer poop. <laughs> or if something is crummy uh, or rubbish, it's roach bar, um, which uh, is, uh, there's a little line that I planted that um, Nestle started a cricket-based um, chocolate bar, and it didn't do very well commercially. And that's where Roach Bar is from. Uh, if, uh, if something's really great, it's malicious. 
And it, instead of saying things are cool, they're careless. Uh, and, but I have a second section in um, 2047, so that necessitated a new set of expressions. And um, uh, when someone is a jerk or a wanker in 2047, they're a T-bill. And if you're talking bullshit, you're talking treasury. <laughs> um, something that's rubbish is splug. And anything that is really great is brutal. Uh, and instead of saying something is, um, you know, like, totally brutal, it's biggin. It's biggin brutal. Uh, and uh, there are nursing homes all over the country. And in the nursing homes, they're broken up into um, morts, who are catatonic, um, blithers, who are demented, and walking shrivs, <laughs> who can at least make it to the loo on their own. <laughs> and you're meant to notice that there is a little connection between shriv and your friend here. <laughs> Um, I was also not interested in um, writing science fiction. It's not that I, I, I'm not dissing science fiction, but I, um, I have, in fact, I have high regard for it, but I'm not very good about inventing technology. I, I don't think that's what I'm good at. And that's not what I wanted to focus the book on. So I kept the, most of the um, change in technology, is, it, it's just stuff that's already in the pipeline. So I don't expect you to be all floored by the fact that there are driverless electric cars. Well, duh. Right? Fine. So, um, but I do make the observation that that means that uh, getting stopped for drunk driving is, uh, is pretty much a thing of the past. Yes, good. Um, and when I bring in uh, the, uh, those household management systems that we are promised, they don't work very well. So I have one household that whose uh, household management system is constantly ordering more milk until they are drowning in it. Um, I did invent um, something called a flex because I think we're all tired of having many, many different devices and I just combined them all into one. And this one is a super fine mesh that will um, stiffen into a variety of sizes so you can turn it into a, a watch, or, or a little phone size screen, or, or a, a, more like a tablet, or more like a computer. I like that. That seemed like a good idea. Um, this doesn't break, uh, so we're no more shattered screens. Um, it, uh, it has a much longer battery life, <laughs> and um, when you loosen it, it uh, you can crumple it in your pocket, just like a Kleenex, in fact. Uh, the early versions, before they were made with uh, distinctive colors, people were constantly throwing it away because they thought it was a handkerchief. So that was kind of fun, but that's, um, that's essentially all, um, that's pretty much all I invented, because that's not my focus. And that's why I, I, I think this book probably qualifies more as uh, Margaret Atwood's speculative fiction than, uh, than science fiction. Um, the second section, uh, is uh, if, if you can say that the first section is about an excess of chaos, about things falling apart because systems have degenerated, the second section is, <clears throat> is about an excess of order. And I think if you look at the dystopian novel, it will divide off between which of those seems more threatening. Now chaos, the, the threats of chaos are obvious. Um, uh, you know, crime, um, that you, you can't make a living, um, uh, the, the arts and the uh, uh, skills of the intellect are no longer uh, treasured. All that matters is uh, m things about primitive survival, so that the farmers become, um, super, they're the ones who become super rich because they control what people really need. Um, but in the second section, the U.S. has got its act together, the real problem is demographic. And this is something that we are looking at for real. Um, it, it has to do with what's called the support ratio, and how few young people are likely to have working to support my generation. 
And um, that means that those young people are going to have to be working more than one job and paying hugely high tax rates. As, especially if my generation lives as long as it looks it's, as if it's going to. So that's why I invented um, my character, Nolly, uh, uh, because I felt that putting myself in the book was a kind of mea culpa. You know, I'm sorry, but it's my generation. We are going to be the big problem. Um, and, and she's something of a parody of, of my, my generation. For example, she's obsessed with exercise and constantly does um, jumping jacks, but, to, but into uh, an age where you know, she's certainly not going to be looking any more attractive. And, and by the end, the kind of jumping jacks she's done are kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> it's totally pathetic. Um, and while I don't want to give the ending away, I will at least promise those of you who make it there that it does have a happy cast. Um, that there is a suggestion of the rebirth of the American project. And while I'm not one of those patriotic um, people who's constantly flag-waving about how great the United States is, I do tend to stick up for the concept of the U.S. And, you know, a lot of countries don't have concepts. They're histories, they're geographies. Um, but we have a formative idea. And that primary idea is that is, as long as you don't hurt other people, you can do whatever you want. And I think that's a great idea. What dismays me about the United States is that it doesn't adhere to that idea. <laughs> right? So it's full of regulations and laws and restrictions on what you can do, regardless of whether you're hurting other people. And, um, you know, I uh, recently filed my 2015 tax return. It was 100 pages long. What a load of rubbish. And it cost me a fortune to pay accountants to, to write this compliant uh, tax return. And to me, that's a form of, of tyranny. And I think that we have become accustomed to what we think of as modern life. Um, in much the way, you know, that classic, uh, the frog warming in the water until it starts to boil and we don't notice. Because, you know, we're, I'm just supposed to take for granted, well, of course my tax return is 100 pages long. Well, I don't. I like to take a step back and say, you know, how did this happen? Why is modern life so complicated? Why is the government so involved in everything we do? Um, so my return to first principles at the very end of this novel is a confessedly libertarian um, political take. And um, I, I admit, it, uh, I am sneaking my opinions into my books. But I mean, honestly, what else is the point of being a novelist? Thank you. really terrific. Oh, I should say it was big and brutal. <laughs> I'm really glad that you brought up the sort of temporality of decay in the novel. You know, I was, I was thinking that it could also have been called Things Fall Apart Very Slowly. Um, <laughs> um, so what that title would have been stealing. <laughs> well, you called the novelist a kleptomaniac, which I, I love. Um, but anyway, um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the way you just negotiate scales in the novel, right? On one hand, it's dealing with a very macro level of decay, the way fiscal responsibility and trade fall apart. But you're also dealing with the fallout of that on a very intimate level. For example, there is a very elaborate section in one of the chapters where the family is figuring out what to do now that the toilet paper has run out. And we actually return to the Roman strategy of using wads of cloth soaked in vinegar. Um, so it, the economic fallout hits us where it hurts, as it were. Um, and of course, it also hits us in, in the emotional realm of having to renegotiate the chaos of family dynamics, right? So people who are, who are once in powerful positions within the family emotionally in terms of economics are now indebted to their poorer, uh, emotionally unstable, crazy relative. Yeah, it's more of the expression of you know, the way money 
affects our relationships with each other. So there are two sisters, one of whom has to move her family into the, the, uh, her older sister's home. And she'd always been the more affluent one. And, um, and that gave her more power. But now when the money is pretty much gone, uh, suddenly she has much less power. And it's interesting to watch that those, those relationships flip. Absolutely. And so I was wondering, how did you begin to engage that macro scale first so that you could figure out the intimate fallout later? Uh, what kind of research did you do into economics and historical depressions, for instance? Um, I did a certain amount of reading um, of, of books. The majority of them had been written since 2008, and I find that the whole field of economics has become bizarrely apocalyptic. Honestly, it's not that much different from reading science fiction. It scared the bejesus out of me. Um, and I'm still scared. Uh, the, I, am, I remain very concerned that the kind of collapse that this is describing uh, is all too possible. And in fact, I would, I would have to accuse myself of one point of complete um, improbability. And that is because I didn't want to talk about the collapse of the entire world. I just wasn't up for it. It's too much. Or too much to bite off and chew. Uh, I had the United States fall apart, but not the rest of the world with it. I think that's unlikely. Okay? So... I mean that's one of the things that I I researched is that you know that we that actually the international economy is forbiddingly interrelated and that's one of the problems we've got economically is that the systems have become too complex and uh, it doesn't take much in a complex system to send the whole thing to hell. One of the things I read about was complexity theory and one of the principles of complexity theory is that complex systems collapse <coughs> catastrophically. And I'm really anxious that this novel is nothing. It's like a, it's, it, it, it's actually less catastrophic than, than what could actually happen. Yeah, I love the term that you come up uh, with for that, this notion of karmic clumping. Um, that as complex systems accumulate, the fall apart is so catastrophic. But I wonder, does that hold true, this notion of karmic clumping, does that hold true for the moral realm of your novel as well? The characters, right, are distinctly unlovable, sometimes moving to amoral and immoral, but do their acts result in that kind of moral catastrophe, according to you? Well, one of the things that happens when um, you become closer and closer to uh, primitive survival is that uh, your, um, the circles of your allegiances tighten. We can afford, uh, when we're all doing fine and we're none of us starving and we have shelter and water and we can come to arts festivals, um, uh, we can all afford to be uh, considerate of each other and decent and um, pay our taxes and you know um, function as a larger society and our lo loyalty is very, is very broad and we obey the rules and honor honor each other's needs in, 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 on, on a national or even international scale if we're very uh, responsible. But when things get grimmer, and resources are tight, the circle of our allegiance gets smaller. And maybe we're only um, concerned about our neighbors, our immediate neighbors, as well as our friends and our relatives. But you know what? It gets, it gets, everything gets tighter still. Fuck the neighbors. It's just your friends and family. And at a certain point, you'll screw your friends too. And I, I'm, I'm very interested in this process of, uh, it is a kind of moral decay. Um, and, uh, you know, I would disagree that all these characters are dislikable. I, I quite fancy most of them. Um, 
and I and I'm interested the way that being put in this increasingly primitive situation uh, affects character, uh, willing the the pr protagonist ends up um, stealing and even um, bullying uh, little boys into sacrificing the groceries that they just bought for their family, and it's a that particular scene is especially disturbing. It's a small scene. He doesn't actually hurt the kid. But it's the first time you've seen him do that. And he didn't seem like the kind of boy who would do that. But he, the, their, their family has nothing to eat. And, and so you get pushed into doing things that you never thought you would. And I'm, that's, that was one of the, you know, I talked about the controlling of scale. That was one of the things that I needed to, to control is, the, is not just to, the, the, the decay in terms of how you treat it in a restaurant but the decay of what you consider acceptable behavior. Thank you. I certainly think we have time for several questions from the audience. Any questions? Um, the mic will come to you. Hi. Hi, um, I'm so glad that you, you came to Singapore. I think this is a really a great privilege for us. Um, my question is uh, regarding the appearance of Singapore in the novel. Um, so I think when, when the main character uh, visits Las Vegas, um, there's a list of casinos. Uh, <laughs> so it goes uh, the Wynn, the Venetian, the Bellagio, the Singapore. Uh, I was just wondering how did that come about and uh, did you have even an image in mind? Like what would be the gimmicky look of the Singapore? <laughs> it would be very, very flashy. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that I did in this novel uh, is that, it, I mean that passage is, is, is classic because most of the casinos that you just mentioned are real, right? And then I throw in the Singapore and there isn't, uh, there isn't a uh, casino in Las Vegas called the Singapore now, but maybe there will be. Um, and and I think the Singapore is perfectly plausible. In fact, it would probably be one of the flashiest and most expensive of of all the casinos out there. So it was a kind of homage. I didn't realize that when I wrote that, that I would end up here. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, writing from a place of fear. So you've also talked about um, writing about fear of motherhood in um, when you talk about Kevin, and I just wanted to have a kind of broader sense of what writing from a place of fear means and what limitations it has or what kind of motivations it provides for you. Well, I've obviously given away that I, I should be on very high doses of anti-anxiety medication. <laughs> I think one of the things that both writing and reading is good for uh, is, is exercising and exorcising uh, anxiety. So I find that when I explore my fears on paper, uh, I, I First of all, it's a, it's, it, it's a communal exercise because I expect other people to read it. It's like, so I'm finding other people who share those concerns. Um, one of the reasons that Kevin found such a large audience is it turns out that there are a lot of women out there who are not too sure about becoming mothers or, or are not too sure about having become mothers. And we're pleased to find a vehicle for the expression of, of their worries. Um, but it's the same in writing, if not more so, that, that it's a, it, it gets it out of the system. And one of the nice things about this book is that I, I mean, I'm petrified of international economic collapse, but I was less petrified of it while I was writing the book because I was getting it out, and it was really fun. And then and the, the, the thing about a, a, a novel is people talk about, oh, you know, I just read this book, it really scared me. But it's a kind of fear. It's a particular kind of fear. It's a safe fear. It's not really happening to you. 
And, and it's, it, it's the very opposite of, of it really happening to you. It's, you know, you can put the book down and go pour a glass of wine. It's, it's, it's the best possible way to explore your own nightmares. Um, it's the ultimate safe space. So it, that's one of the purposes that books serve. Um, and, and I think for both parties, for both the writer and the reader. Let me add to that as well, um, a, a question about other kinds of anxiety in the novel. You characterize them as primarily economic, but there's also a considerable degree of racial anxiety that remains in the theater of the future. Um, but the hegemony is sort of flipped, right? So Spanish becomes um, the language that is compulsory in schools, and German is outlawed or banned in schools. Well, it's not outlawed. Oh, prefer, no. pre they prefer not to. It's it's not often offered. Okay, that's a good way to put it. Um, but there's all this <coughs> continued, you know, the continuance of prejudice, the continuance of bigotry exists, but there's a kind of flip in dynamic. Um, could you talk a little bit about that continued racial anxiety into the future? Well, I was um, looking at the statistics, and by 2029, <laughs> um, a third of the American population is going to be Hispanic. And... Um, that's just a fact. So, uh, as a gesture of inclusivity, the um, the protocol on um, automated phone calls is that you press one for Spanish and two for English, which makes some white Americans really mad. Um, in the in in the in a similar fashion, the uh, the Chinese have insisted on taking the uh, international phone code uh, of one from the United States, <laughs> which also makes a lot of Americans mad. I love the little stuff. I just think it's, it's highly entertaining. Um, and I didn't want to get into too serious a, a racial thing. It's a background side thing because it's not what the book is about. But I do address some of the simmering um, resentment in the in the white ma what what is by now barely a white majority um, and on the way to becoming a white minority and uh, this was before this election came along and it became such a big deal but I certainly anticipated the fact that um, if not already then then soon uh, there was going to be a sector of uh, the white am American population that wasn't necessarily going to go quietly, that resented the fact that they were losing their hegemony and um, losing power and becoming part of a more diverse society that, um, that uh, they don't control anymore. And there's certainly those undercurrents all through, all through the book. Uh, and I hope that it's, it's the, the representation of those currents is is balanced because I meant from an authorial perspective to remain completely <coughs> neutral, but the characters aren't neutral. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, that 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 state of affairs is is a, it's already fait accompli. That's going to be the way the United States is in the future, and I think that this election has been, um, in some ways, the beginning of the, a, a a last gasp of white dominance, and but it is. Um, doomed demographically, and I think we we should be a little understanding about that. That doesn't mean that we are um, we we are sympathetic with racist attacks or or bigotry or any of that. But when you are part of a group of people who who has been in control under the impression it is their country, and then suddenly, you know, it gets, you, you know, taken away from you, it's a weird feeling. It does, it, um, it, it feels something like a, a, a military invasion. I mean, after all, when people come into a, a, a democracy, then they also uh, have political power. So it is a seeding of political power. And... That is, that's a, I, all I would say is it's a big ask. 
emotionally. We're um, we're a very territorial species, and you know if you want to flip it around and uh, put a situation where you've got uh, huge numbers of uh, Americans, white Americans, pouring into Mexico, I guarantee you there would be a lot of resentment among Mexicans. And um, in fact, this is one of the weirder aspects of this book because again, it was written before this campaign, but in my novel, there is a wall between <laughs> America and Mex Mexico, but um, this wall, oh, and this wall, it's built by Mexico. <laughs> and they pay for it. <laughs> it's to keep the Americans out. And I think that's why that word unflinching really does describe the novel, because of that distance you've been able to manage between authorial opinion, and it, which is, remains neutral, and the characters who are distinctly not neutral. Um, I do think we have time for one more question. I, I think the gentleman over there. Okay, um, my first question is about living overseas as an American. Did that play a role in the way you treated the IRS and the tax agencies as particularly evil? And since, since you keep bringing up Trump, if Trump and the Republicans do as promised and repeal FACTA, will that make you dislike him a little bit less? And the third thing is, okay, I, because I myself hate filling out my U.S. taxes, and I've, I've had a return once that was double yours, so I've had a 200-page return. Uh. <laughs> okay, but having said that, so I totally agree with how mean you were about the IRS and the character of the person, the, the, the cousin who went to work for the IRS, but it just seemed like you were a little bit extra mean to poor Lowell, and I was wondering <laughs> Why you beat up on that guy? So, I mean, you made him into a total, he was supposed to be an economics professor, but he couldn't even figure out what his money was worth when he went to the grocery store. So why were you so mean to Lowell? <laughs> well, I'm kind of touched to see that you've come to his defense. <laughs> um, Lowell is, uh, is a, a, a Keynesian economist. And I guess because that way of thinking, this um, spending, government spending, deficit spending, um, year after year, uh, to stimulate the economy or whatever, is one of the culprits in the in the novel that. Uh, Lowell is not concerned about sovereign debt and, and, and thinks that it can grow to a virtually infinite degree. Uh, so that's one reason I embarrassed him. Um, as a character, one of, the pro one of the problems going on is that he's always had, um, you know, other people do for him. So he's kind of at a loss in the grocery store. And he doesn't... Um, he doesn't do a very good job of keeping track with the mon of the, what the money is worth, because, partly because the economics are not working out in a way that proves him right, and it annoys him, right? The, 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 the outside world is not reflecting what it's supposed to according to theory. And so that makes him disconnected from reality. Because, and, and you know, you know there are people who are such ideologues that they project their ideas onto reality, and that's what they want to see. And it's and and they get quite flustered when reality doesn't reflect what the what what it's supposed to. And I, that's what I was trying to get at. And maybe I was a little cruel to him, but um, at least I got your sympathy going. <laughs> Um, and, and as for the taxes, I think you're right emotionally because uh, Americans uh, are among um, the uh, oh, people from only four countries in the world uh, whose, whose countries demand that regardless of where they live, uh, they have to declare their worldwide income to the country they were born in. The only way to keep from filing a tax return every year 
even as an expat, is to renounce your citizenship. And as a matter of fact, there have been any number of people, that, in, in, in escalating quantities, Americans who have renounced their citizenship, be, mostly because of the tax situation. It is such a burden. Um, and I'm in an especially irritating situation because I'm living in the UK and they have a completely different tax year from April 6th to April 5th, if you can believe it. <laughs> Which makes reporting just, oh, it's just a nightmare. And, you are, and, and, and I agree, you know, yes, you, you caught me out. Uh, this is an emotional amplifier of resentment. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, that's why Elliot called me for the cruelest one. Um, well, thank you everyone for your brilliant questions. I'm afraid that's all we have the time for. Um, but I do invite you to continue your questions and your conversations with Lionel at the book signing that's happening at the foyer. Thank you so much for being here and thank you all for being here as well.